This is the Jeff Santos Show. 33 minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santos Show. Trump making more comments. Uh, it's unbelievable. Um, our next guest uh, comes to us uh, from the great uh, Seattle WA. Uh, he, of course, is uh, a great, great uh, journalist. Uh, Democracy Watch News is a lot where you can find his uh interviews and other uh, notes and so forth. He, of course, is uh, also a great musician, and um, you can find him playing, although it's been a little pause when, with COVID coming back. We don't know exactly how long that pause will be, but uh, uh, he's getting his uh, band back together. They've been in the studio. And, of course, he's a contributor to this very show every Friday, uh, usually in the 5.30 window, Eastern Time, 2.30 Pacific, uh, he is, of course, the great MTC. Mark Taylor Canfield, live in Seattle, WA. How are you, Mr. Mark Taylor Canfield? I recommend everybody go to YouTube and uh, look at the uh, look up the song Mother Freedom by Mark Taylor Canfield, and you can check out uh, uh, our song about people struggling for freedom and democracy and justice all over the world. So uh, all you have to do is put in Mark Taylor Canfield, Mother Freedom, and you'll see all sorts of clips during the music video of protests in Hong Kong, Belarus, the Ukraine, Nigeria, and lots of footage of Black Lives Matter uh, marches here in the United States. And the song is called Mother Freedom because we all know that freedom from bigotry and authoritarianism is the mother of all democracy as well as press freedom, which is something I report on constantly as executive director for Democracy Watch News, which, by the way, has launched a bunch of new initiatives, including some weekly video reports at YouTube, uh, Twitter space converse- conversations every Tuesday, and you can check out my articles at democracywatchnews.org, and also our audio podcasts are called Democracy Cast. And that's on all the major podcast providers. So I'm here in the studio from Seattle, rocking the house, Jeff. Uh, I don't know what the weather's like in in your neck of the woods, so to speak, but it's been terrible here. What's it been like in Massachusetts? Well, it's up and down. Uh, today it was uh, close to 60 degrees. I think it might have even reached 60 wow. here on the south coast. Uh, you know, a couple of days ago it was uh, 33 and and in the, the, the 20s at night. So we're all over the place, man. It's not good for uh, cold season or flu season. It's uh, obviously uh, you know part of um, you know climate change, and it's it is what it is. It's uh, it's going to change, man, because uh, you know what we saw in tornado land in, in Kentucky. Uh, you know, is is in every state in this country. Well, it's all over the planet, obviously. Uh, so, yeah. You had 60 um, degrees? Yeah, I would 60. be out in my kayak on 60 degrees, degrees sunning myself because it hasn't gotten anywhere near that here. In fact, the band project is on hiatus for the holidays because the drummer's traveling to some sunnier climates because the weather here in Seattle has been awful for a month now with gray skies and cold rain. But that gives me a lot of time away from those kind of outdoor activities on the boat and kayaking to work on recording the music and writing for several websites and news outlets, as well as my novel called The Adventures of Nick Savage, Private Eye, the fictional Seattle private detective character I've developed. So I've been really busy, despite the inclement weather, and actually watching a lot of great movies, too. And I do write Yes, we've seen your Twitter for... account, man. Uh, you've, been, you've been watching Citizen Kane and all that kind of stuff. Good yeah. for you. And, if you um, want to talk about you know. that sometime in the future, if you want to talk about movies in the future and the reviews I write for the Seattle Star, I'm all about that, because there's some really great movies out there and a lot of them are actually available free online, so you don't necessarily have to have an Amazon Prime membership or Netflix to watch some of these movies. So, and uh, Internet Archive, archive dot org, that website has a lot of great classic movies that are free too. So we can always talk about that sometime in the future because there's a lot of great political movies out there too. That and movies like Trumbo, which I just saw about Dalton Trumbo and the whole Red Scare thing with Joe McCarthy, that is really I think apropos to a lot of things we're dealing with today. So. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about there for sure. No doubt. Uh, well, I want to start with uh, the latest news, and we uh, we were talking uh, about it and teasing it earlier today about uh, Miss Sawant there, the city councilor, the Democratic Socialist city councilor, great friend of uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, and, and so forth, uh, has won again and taken on the establishment. We were worried, I think, when we talked uh, over a month ago, and here we are again, Mark. Uh, it is, to me, a... Um, 
a, a great effort, uh, particularly as we talked yesterday with Governor Dukakis. It's all about uh, grassroots, door to door, as he calls it, precinct captain. Uh, you know, it's the field operation, and she obviously has the great volunteer base, uh, and people understand it. And uh, you know, what an underdog victory! Uh, what's the latest on the whole that all that? Well, uh, it's a very close margin of victory for Shama Sawant in this recall election. Uh, the the election is actually being certified today, but uh, until December 21st, people have an option to request a recall, according to the Public Disclosure Commission. A recount, And that can be done... Excuse me? Yeah, a recount. I'm sorry. Right, um, right. So we can, requ- we can request a recall um, here. There are no automatic recounts in the local elections here in Seattle. But you can uh, you can actually request one, and that can be done in several different ways. You can it can be a request from the candidate so want, which I doubt she's going to do since she's declared victory, or it can be requested by a political party representative, or even just a group of five or more voters. Jeff, so I would not be surprised if the business interests who sponsored the recall campaign uh, will ask for a recount due to the narrow margin of Sawant's victory. And although it would cost them about $10,000, I'm sure well, they <laughs> have the money. all their wealthy corporate <laughs> backers and tax money, it'd be no problem for those folks. Um, and they've already spent, uh, there's already been close to $2 million spent on this recall election, and that includes contributions from both sides. And believe it or not, Jeff, it looks like Sawant supporters have actually been able to raise more money than most of their opponents in this election. And, you know, we've seen how effective some progressive candidates like Bernie Sanders have been in raising money by getting small small donations donations from individuals. Yeah, and it just goes to prove that you can beat these wealthy corporatists if you have an authentic grassroots support amongst your constituents. And from folks all across the country, actually, who support Sawant's effort to stand up for the little guy against this behemoth in the real estate development and other industries, and it's, you know, it's always amazing to me how loath conservative interests are to provide money for education and health care and other social programs. But, boy, they sure don't mind sinking millions of dollars into PACs and political campaigns. So it just goes to show you what the priorities are there. I often wonder, you know, how much good could be done if instead of throwing so much money at trying to defeat progressive city council members, Amazon would actually put that money into funding affordable housing, building hospitals or schools, you know. And, of course, the, the real issue here is that the recall effort has been a major distraction from Swan City Council business during a major economic and health crisis, which is probably, you know, part of the strategy of her opponents, which is to keep her so busy fighting the recall that her hands are tied when it comes to actually doing the business of the people and trying to solve some of these major issues we face here, like mass homelessness due to, due to the skyrocketing rents. We have no rent control in Seattle and billion-dollar gentrification schemes, which is moving all the working-class people out of the city. So it's been a very difficult time for working people and folks experiencing poverty in Seattle. And I just think that this recall election has done nothing but make it more difficult to actually get things done that will actually help people. Because Seattle has done a pretty good job at um, giving uh, relief assistance. You know, it's kind of like the Great Depression and, you know, FDR. There's a lot of relief programs that people have uh, had access to in Seattle and in Martin Luther King Jr. County. And it's just a shame to see the, our most effective Seattle city council member being distracted and having to spend so much of her time uh, fighting this recall campaign. But she's one, and, you know, she's all over the place. They're writing about her at The Nation and The New Republic and The Washington Post and The New York Times and foreign newspapers. So, once again, she's beat the odds. She beat the pundits who were predicting that she was going to lose this election. And even if there is a recount, uh, which I wouldn't be doubt, I wouldn't doubt that that might happen. Although the recall folks have not have not said that yet, but you know they have told December twenty fourth to make to make that call. So it may happen. But even if there is a recount, I I kind of doubt they're going to win this. I think that Swan's got it wrapped up. There aren't enough votes to really to change the situation. It's really close. But I, I doubt that will happen. If it does, then, you know, I'll, I'll admit that I'm wrong and that I made the wrong prediction. But so far, it looks like she's got the momentum. And she's got more support, I think, than the corporate interests uh, had counted on. So, you know, they're, they kind of got, uh, got outmaneuvered. <laughs> Let's put yeah, it that that's way. great. So, hey, you know, interestingly enough, we got somebody on the line who actually gave uh, a, a donation 3,000 miles away in uh, in Central Florida, our good friend Peter. I know he has a couple of comments to talk about on that. Uh, Peter, you're next with Mark Taylor Canfield. Go right ahead, man. 
Hey, Peter. Hey, thank you. Can you hear? Hey, thanks, Mark. You guys can hear me okay? Go right ahead, Peter. Yeah. I can hear you fine. Okay. Hey, I, yeah. I just, you know, she's such a fantastic politician that knows that it's the uh, middle class and poor, and she delivers for them. She fights harder than anybody I know. One thing is that I wish she could do is put up a list of her victories of what one person can do and what she's done to Seattle and then what battles to come in another list so that we can compare her fight against other politicians who do nothing but collect a check, a pension, and great health care. I mean, she like really it. puts it on the line. You know, she has, she you has, and she has beaten it, beaten back all the all the big power interest, uh, whether it's Starbucks or whether it's uh, Bezos, uh, in particular. Uh, you know, on and on, Gates and so on and so forth. It, it's uh, it's remarkable, and I really appreciate you, Peter, getting involved. I know you you follow uh, it intensely, closely, but to get involved in a city council race three thousand miles away, kudos to you uh, for for really backing up what you uh, what you talk about. Um, you know, Mark, it, it's it's you interesting know what I would that. Say? She, one second, Peter. I, I would, Go ahead, Mark. I would say that, you know, it's it's it does not behoove the corporate interests to take her on because every time they do and she wins, it just gives her more publicity, more media coverage. She becomes more of an international and national figure. So it kind of backfires on them every time. If I were them, I would just kind of keep their mouths shut and, you know, try to do their business and leave the city council alone because it's not working for them right now. Yeah, you, 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 uh, really? you make her more popular. Go ahead, Peter. They're terrified. They're terrified that her movement will spread. That's what the corporations are terrified about. You know, the city, the city council in Seattle is a thorn in their side. But if her movement spreads to all of Seattle, to California, and this is how we measure politicians that say they're for us, a whole lot of freeloading politicians that have been getting votes won't get votes anymore. We need more candidates by her. Tell her she's doing a great job, but we need a cheat sheet to show her accomplishments and her battles to come because she should be proud of what she's done. A lot of people have no idea. Hey, well, thank she's you, Peter. Also a lot better, she's also a lot better at keeping her constituents informed about city business. The other council members don't seem to do that. They seem to just have their meetings with people, and, and you know, once a, a month they might put out a newsletter. But, you know, I, I get text message alerts all the time from Shama Sawan and her supporters saying, you know, this, uh, rent, uh, this rent control bill is coming up before the city council. We need to get out there and support it. You know, this is what the opposition is doing. This is how much money they're raising. This is what we need to do. It's very organized. She has a very good outreach uh, a program and, and, and a way of communicating with people across the, the city. So, you know, if other candidates and other uh, elected officials were had more of that in mind, you know, their responsibility to actually communicate with their constituents, that would be helpful, too. I think that's one of the, her strong points for sure. You know, I'm, I'm very impressed by that. And uh, I think, yeah, um, there has been some success in local government, um, city councils and school boards for democratic socialists across the country. They're still fighting this huge battle when it comes to national politics and even state uh, level politics. So right now, they're, you know, they're not getting elected to the state legislatures or to the governor's offices, but they are effective in some um, areas on the city council. And there is actually a uh, uh, an online conference going on later today by the Democratic Socialists of America talking with some of those candidates that got elected to city councils around the country this, this time around. So, you know, it's still at the local level, but that's where democracy is right now, you know, where you can actually fight the big money and get something done is, you know, right there at City Hall, right there on the, on the school boards and in some county elections. The statewide and national elections are pretty much sewed up by the two major parties right now, so it's been very difficult for uh, democratic socialists to make inroads there but we'll see you know you never know you have to start um down there and local politics and build up and that's i'm sure what they're thinking right now hey how closely is she work you know obviously they're both fellow fellow india uh indian americans um with jayapal i mean jayapal has obviously had her, her star rise um, you know a lot of a lot of work as the uh, leader in the house progressive um community i mean do they have a, a working relationship um you know that that is close and you know i don't know if they would share funders and stuff but uh uh, what is the relationship? You know both of them. Well, first of all, Pramila Jayapal is very much a member of the Democratic Party, whereas um, 
Shama Swan has been working with Socialist Alternative and Democrat, the Democratic Socialists of America. So they have two different political parties. So yes, their funding sure. mechanisms are different, and their party uh, affiliations are different. But yeah, when you know Bernie Sanders comes to town, he's meeting with them both. So you'll often see the three of them together. So I don't know what their personal relationship is like, but I haven't heard any criticism um, about each other. So it sounds to me like they get along pretty well and have some of the same views in mind, regardless of you know, their political affiliations, because Swan is used to working with coalitions. She's used to working with progressive Democrats and small businesses and labor unions. So, you know, she's she's not an exclusive to the to the socialist parties. Uh, she actually is willing to work with anybody who will support the causes that um, she supports. She's about uh, issue oriented politics, not necessarily party politics. You know, I I just uh, I just think it's it's a uh, it's a great great um, incubator, if you might, um, for for progressive, real progressive politics, not the phony ones that uh, that have been out there uh, in recent years, and you know, still out there today. Uh, there's a report, I believe, out in one of the. Um, investigative journals uh, about a number of Democrats who purport to be uh, progressive and they're, they're taking money from from fossil fuel companies and uh, credit card companies and all this other kind of stuff, uh, so-called progressives. Uh, but that's that's great. And again, thank you, Peter, for the call. I want to take uh, our good friend John in Minneapolis in a second here. But to me, the, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, where San Francisco may, may have been, you know, the most progressive city for a long, long time in the country, uh, we now have a, a situation where I believe uh, Seattle has taken over that moniker, uh, and, and that's no fault to San Francisco. It's just that you know that's where the energy is, and I think that's that's a great sign for the progressive movement. All right, let's go to uh, the great city of Minneapolis. You are next with Mark Taylor Canfield. You know, very similar so on to what is happening with Miss Omar. Yeah, uh, Miss Omar is very progressive. Uh, she is a member of the Democratic Party, but we've also uh, voted in uh, three Democratic Socialists uh, to our city council. So uh, it can be done, and I've I've uh, been involved somewhat with the Democratic Socialists of America in supporting Bernie Sanders, and I was really impressed with them, uh, even more than, um, you know, the, the uh, Socialist Alternative, which I know is what... Uh, uh, Kasharma Sawant is uh, a member of, but uh, you know her victory is a victory for the entire country. Uh, you know this uh, wave of uh, uh, socialist progressive candidates winning, uh, you know, locally is uh, you know is fantastic. And then uh, Bernie Sanders being an independent socialist. Uh, he is a socialist. So socialism is not a bad thing. Socialism uh, built the progressive movement in the you know beginning or late 19th century, early 20th century is responsible uh, for the union movement. Uh, Eugene Debs was a big uh, uh, figure in that, and he actually won uh, it, or he ran rather for presidency from uh, a prison cell and won, uh, garnered a lot of votes. Unfortunately, the way our system is set up, we have a two-party system, but we do need to take over the Democratic Party uh, to democratize the Democratic Party and bring it back uh, to its roots. Uh, right. I and, think you look at FDR yeah, and, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think the absolutely. distinction, though, yeah. is, uh, John, is that, you know, FDR didn't call himself a democratic socialist because he didn't want to, no. I think, at the time, tie himself to socialism, right. which was being used on a wrongly basis in communist Soviet right. Union. And I think that's the whole confusion. It's still, for, for a lot of people, say, over the age of 75 or even 70, you know, they they look at, at socialism as against because they're thinking, and of course, we even see this now with the Latino community, particularly in Cuba, because, of course, that connects to Castro. Right. So, you know, that's right. the whole thing. I mean, it, most of the country, particularly <laughs> younger people, don't right. don't really have that fear because, you know, well, they don't they didn't really right. connect the, the, the yeah. what's happening with Fidel Castro in you no, know 1950s no. and 60s. So, um, yeah, you have it's to remember, complete. too, William Randolph Hearst, who was the who was the Jeff Bezos of his time and owned the media and, you know, owned so many newspapers and, you know, was also appeasing Hitler. But he uh, called FDR a Bolshevik. 
And we still have that today right. where we're living in Cold War era. And I see it all the time, and I've been writing about this at Facebook, yeah. on Facebook, is that right. you have the right. The right is always giving way too much credit, actually, to the left. Because there right. isn't really much of a left yeah. in the United States at this point. It's really no. a small number of people. And none of them that are getting any sort of public platform are what I would call radical Marxist or anything like that. They are democratic socialists. Yeah. They work in coalitions with people who are not socialists. And they're not calling for any right. kind of violent revolution or Soviet-style dictatorship, yeah. authoritarian. Well, that's the scare they tactic. That's what you do level. if you're on the right wing. You, you, you play the scare tactics. And, yeah, and uh, right. that's what they have done effectively well. Well, you know, that's what the Republicans are, are, are known for. You know, you, you make the scare, you know, whether it's brown people well, with the people coming across the border or African-Americans, you know, back in the 80s, welfare queens, all that stuff. That's all made up to scare people. You know, I mean, you know, just the, the whole the whole idea they're going to come in. Yeah. Willie Horton would do caucus back in 88. You know, uh, yeah. you know, he's going to come into your house and he's going to attack your wife. That's what they do. And right. uh, and they do it pretty well, tragically enough. Yeah, I never hear uh, Shama Sawan or the other Democratic Socialists even mentioning Marx. Most of the time, they are interested in issue of politics, not. and what she keeps repeating over and over again is that she wants to support working people and people living in poverty and working families. That's what they're about. And that's why they actually are striking, uh, you know, they're actually getting um, some consensus out there that they're doing the right thing because you have a lot of working class people in this country that are really struggling and we're you know and we're questioning people like hillary clinton and some of the corporate democrats and now you have democratic socialists out there and some of them are in the democratic party who it sounds like are speaking to them and they really appreciate that it's something that the the working class in the united states hasn't had for a long time and the labor unions haven't had a support from political leaders who are willing to stand up and fight for them. And we see that right now with Bernie Sanders, you know, with the Kellogg situation there. Right. He's we down there. In, yeah, he's up there in Battle Creek, Carson Michigan situation. today, as exactly. We had uh, Mr. Yeah. Bradshaw the other day talking just about that. Uh, thank you, uh, John, for uh, for a great uh, uh, commentary and connection, I think, to what's happening there in Minneapolis with Ms. Omar and the uh, newly elected folks on the uh, city council in Minneapolis. Uh, because it's got about a minute or two left here. I, I want to get your thoughts about the black tones and the music situation with COVID and we just talked to Doug McLean the hockey coach about you know what's happening with the NHL and of course the crack and play there uh, there's a lot of games been postponed similar on the NFL uh, this week a lot of th- games I think this weekend are now being pushed back to Monday and Tuesday and so forth um, as it, is it is it making an impact on the music clubs uh, you know, I, I know, I know that uh, you're, you're following your friends at the Black Tones. I mean, what has it been over these last few days in terms of, of shutting down, or are they just battling through the whole thing? Well, you have to show proof of vac- vaccination or a negative test in order to get into these clubs. So the okay, that's musicians good. are feeling a little bit safer to perform. And yeah, the Black Tones performed at the Paramount Theater, a beautiful theater here in Seattle. And it was the 30th anniversary of a performance by Nirvana there. So they showed the film of that live performance. There was also a band called Them that performed another great band in Seattle. So, no, I think it's looking up. Um, there are, People are going to the clubs in Seattle. As I said, you know, people love music in Seattle, so you can't keep them down. They're kind of like Shama Sawat. <laughs> Even during a pandemic and economic slowdown, they're going to try to get out to the clubs. So I think the Black Tones especially have a lot of support, and the music fans in Seattle are true to form they are hitting the clubs and they are supporting the local musicians and we've lost a few clubs because of the economic economic downturn but the the ones that we all know like the showbox is still there um you know the crocodile is still there numos is still there doing their thing and you know i think the bands are getting a lot of support so it's really nice to see that jeff seattle's back and people that's, are rocking this, rocking the town. Again. That's great. Oh, I, I urge you to be safe, but uh, go out there and, and uh, enjoy making music, man. Particularly if people are showing their IDs and they're real, not phony ones. Uh, I think that's a great thing. Uh, keep safe, my friend, Mark. We'll probably won't talk to you until 22, but uh, enjoy your holiday, man. Uh, happy Christmas, happy holidays, and happy New Year. All the best, Mark. Happy holidays to you and all of your listeners. Keep on rocking, Jeff. You're doing a great job. Thank you, man. You too. We'll be right back. Uh, <laughs> right back. We're going to be uh, back on Monday, folks, and uh, maybe Tuesday, too. Uh, lots going on. We'll uh, talk to you about it then. Have yourself a great weekend. Please be safe. 
keep on fighting peacefully. Have yourself a great weekend, folks. My name is Jeff Santos, and right now it is my time to say I gotta go. The Jeff Santos Show is heard every weekday on this station between 3 and 6 p.m. To listen to podcasts of The Jeff Santos Show, go to Revolution Radio Network. With SRN News, I'm Jason Walker. President Biden acknowledges now his sweeping social spending package more than likely will not be approved by Christmas. Lacking the necessary votes in the Senate, Democrats will not be able to meet their self-imposed Christmas deadline. West Virginia's Joe Manchin continues to oppose the nearly $2 trillion package. In a written statement, the president said discussions with Manchin will continue, and he predicted the bill will eventually pass. But pushing it into next year is a setback for Democrats. Greg Clugston, Washington. Major typhoon battering the Philippines. At least 12 people are dead in massive flooding. 24 people have been killed in a fire in an eight-story building in Osaka, Japan. Police say it appears to be an act of arson. And four small children have been killed in a house fire in London. Also at SRNnews.com, more than 40 conservative figures sending a letter to House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy urging him to remove Representatives Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney from the House GOP conference. The group said the two Republicans should be booted from the House conference, quote, due to their egregious...